Well, let's see, we're at episode 15, and we've just finished an, another set of material for our second exam. And episode 15 is a, is a review and, and a study guide for, for uh, the second exam. Uh, this is Math 1050 College Algebra, and I'm Dennis Allison, and I teach in the Mathematics Department at UVSC. Uh, if you remember, when we first began the material for the, for the uh, second uh, test, uh, we first introduced some fundamental graphs of some higher degree polynomial functions. And uh, let's look at the first, um, at the first um, graphic there. And I better mention this before we get into those fundamental functions. Uh, let me remind you that you cannot use a calculator on this exam. Now, if you think back, you've probably seen me use a graphing calculator on just a few occasions uh, thus far during this material. But there won't be any problems on the exam that would require you to use a graphing calculator. And uh, therefore, you, you cannot have one available to you. You see, on this test, we want to find out if you know how to graph these functions without using a graphing calculator, and if you know the important characteristics of a, of, of a function as you graph it. Uh, the next thing is you, uh, you cannot, of course, bring any notes. You can't use the textbook during the test. Uh, there'll be some scratch paper attached with your exam, which you can use if you need it. But uh, there should be enough room on the exam for you to work most of the problems right there. But you should turn in all of the scratch paper uh, with your test, even the paper that was not used. And uh, finally, be sure to show your work so that you justify your answers. Now, um, on, there are some problems that are so short that there's really not much work, if anything, to show. But uh, on the more complicated problems, uh, you wouldn't want to just write down an answer, because then we'd have no way of knowing how you uh, arrived at your answer. If you, haven't, uh, if you haven't worked it out in some form. If you do show your work on scratch paper, leave us a note on the exam to tell us to look on the scratch paper, and then number it or circle it on the scratch paper so we can find it so that it's, so that it's easier for us to, uh, to locate. Okay, now let's go to the next graphic. And um, back in episode nine, we introduced um, several higher order polynomial functions. Uh, the, the first two there that you see listed, f of x equals x squared and f of x equals x cubed, were two fundamental functions from, the, uh, from earlier episodes. But now we know how to graph x to the fourth, x to the fifth, x to the sixth, and you remember there are target points for those. Now, let's come to the green screen and let me just remind you how that goes. Uh, for f of x equals x squared, uh, there were three target points, and uh, the target points were located at... Um, 1, 1, 0, 0, and negative 1, 1. And so when we draw that graph, we use only those points, and we graph this parabola. Now, if I ask you to graph this function on the exam, uh, the instructions will say for you to use target points only. Don't make a table of values. Uh, in class, you recall, some time ago when I graphed this for the first time, I did make a table of values, but that was the last time we did for this function. And instead, we located the target points 1, 1, 0, 0, and negative 1, 1. So you're responsible for knowing what the target points are and not, uh, not, cal <coughs> excuse me, not calculating or locating more points than that on the graph. Because you remember what we're after here is speed and not accuracy. So I'm not, a, I'm not expecting you to uh, get a totally accurate graph, but it should generally have this shape. Uh, another fundamental function was f of x equals x cubed. And this goes back to earlier episodes. <coughs> and um, in this case, the target points are, uh, let's see, can anybody tell me in the class, what are the target points for x cubed? 1, 1. 1, 1, yeah. 0, 0. 0, 0. And negative. One, negative, one. negative one, negative one. Yes. Now, on, on the exam, I would draw these axes neatly, so you wouldn't have to draw the axes and label them. Um, and if there's no indication of what the scaling is, these are all one unit. So, for example, this is three, and this must be positive three up here as well. So these are the three target points, and then you're, you should know that the general shape of the graph is that it comes down like a, well, what they used to call a higher parabola. This is no longer referred to as a higher parabola. It's just a cubic curve. Uh, and then it goes down into the third quadrant. So this graph appears only in the first and third quadrants. Okay, now, uh, for the new fundamental functions that were on that list, let's look at how we would graph, say, x to the fourth. Um, and x to the fourth power. And it has three target points, and they're identical to the target points that we had for f of x equals x squared, because you see this is an even function, and it's symmetric about the y-axis. 
So the target points are at 1, 1, 0, 0, and negative 1, 1. Um, now, when I draw this graph, it may look like a parabola, but uh, technically there are some differences in it and the graph of f of x equals x squared. Can anyone remind me what the what are the differences between x to the fourth and x squared, and David? Doesn't it flatten out more at the bottom? It's flattened. It, it's a little flatter in the middle. Yeah. So right here, uh, I may be exaggerating it too much, but it's a, it's a little bit flatter there. And what about on the two outer edges? Uh, Stephen? It goes up much steeper then. It, it goes up steeper, yeah. So this is going to rise faster. So it goes up faster. It doesn't go up vertically, <coughs> and, it, and it's not straight, although it may look straight the way I'm drawing it because it's just a freehand graph. But this is, a bit, this is a bit exaggerated, but that's what the fourth power function looks like. Uh, now, let's just pick a, a higher degree polynomial, such as uh, f of x equals x to the um, 13th power. I don't know that we've actually graphed that particular function before, but I, th I think you know enough about these fundamental polynomials to know what they're going to look like. Um, can anyone tell me the target points for x to the 13th? Negative 1, negative 1. Negative 1, negative 1. 0, 0. 0, 0. And 1, 1. And 1, 1. Okay. And uh, Jeff, it sounds like you're right on the money here. What's the graph going to look like? It's going to look similar to the x cubed function, but it's going to climb a lot steeper. Much more exaggerated. In fact, it's going to look almost vertical here. And then in the middle, it's going to look almost flat. And it looks like it's running along the x-axis, but actually it crosses it only at 0. And then it's almost vertical right there. For example, if I were to choose 1 half, which is right there, halfway between 0 and 1, of course. And if I substituted in 1 half into this function, uh, 1 half to the 13th power is about 1 over 8,000. So the altitude of the graph at a half is about 1 8,000th. Well, now, we're, there's no way we're going to be able to distinguish that from 0. That shows you how close the graph is uh, already to the x-axis. But if I come over here to x to the fourth at 1 half, what is 1 half to the fourth power? 16? 1 over 16. Six, yeah, 1 over 16. Now, we don't think of 1 over 16 as being, 1 over 16 as being very big, but that actually sounds huge compared to 1 over 8,000, uh, 1 over 16. So you see, this graph has already begun to leave just a little bit from the x-axis, and over here it's running very, very close to the x-axis. So things get, things get more exaggerated. They're steeper, they're flatter, and they're steeper again as they exit. Um, another uh, item that was on that, uh, can we go back to episode number 9, that graphic? Another thing that was on that list <coughs> in episode number 9 is to know how to make transformations of these functions. And um, let me just show you what I mean by that. Suppose I wanted to graph uh, g of x equals uh, 2 times x plus 2 to the um, fifth power. 2 times x plus 2 to the fifth power. Well, this is basically, over here, if I'm thinking of my fundamental graph, I'm basically going to be graphing g of x equals x to the fifth, but I'll be making two changes. There's a stretch of 2, and I have to shift it to the left two units. So um, when I graph this, I better put in a few more markings over here on the left because we're moving it that way. Here's the x-axis and here's the y-axis. I'm going to move it over two units, so this is my new origin. And there's a stretch of two, so if I go over one, I go up two. And because this is an odd power degree, if I go to the left one, I should go down one, but the stretch says I should go down two. And now, at, uh, at, with these three target points, I'll sketch x to the fifth shifted over. So it's going to come down fairly steep, steeper than the cubic function. It's going to flatten out, uh, and it's going to turn, and it's going to go down here. So this is a rough sketch of the graph. Uh, I'll just put a g beside it. So you should be able to make transformations where there are vertical uh, transformations or translations, horizontal translations, uh, stretches and compressions, and if I put a negative on that, that would flip it over. So you should be able to do those things. Okay, let's go to episode 10 and look at the uh, review items for episode 10. Here we are. Uh, now, I should uh, remind you that if you look on the website, you'll actually see a few more items listed than what I have on, this, on these graphics because there wasn't enough time or even space, actually, on the graphic to put all the things that could be on the test. But what I've done is to sort of hit the highlights of uh, each episode here. 
uh, let's say you should be able to perform long division and synthetic division. So let's just do an example of each one of those. If I were doing long division, say if we wanted to divide, um, can someone give me a cubic polynomial? Uh, let's start off with just an x cubed. x cubed and then what? Uh, 7x squared. Plus 7x squared. Minus 9x. Minus 9x. Plus 13. Plus 13, okay. And suppose I wanted to divide this by x squared uh, plus x minus 2. I'm just making that up as well. Now, is this a problem that I could use synthetic division on? No. I don't think so because I'm not dividing by a linear polynomial with variable coefficient 1. In other words, I'm not dividing by x plus a constant or x minus a constant. So this, is a, this has a quadratic term in it, so I'd have to use long division. And long division would go like this. Um, I would list all of the terms inside. And if I, were, if I were missing a term, I'd have to leave a space for that degree. But it looks like we have all the terms accounted for here. And then I divide the lead term of the divisor into the lead term of the dividend. This is sometimes referred to as the dividend. Uh, x squared goes into x cubed x times. So I'll put an x in the x column. And if you put your x up here at the front, that's okay with me. But I think it looks neater and it's a little bit easier to follow if you keep all your powers in line with one another. So x times x squared is x cubed. And if I continue to multiply plus x squared minus 2x, then I have to subtract those off. Now, some students go through and change all the signs of those terms. I hesitate to do that because once you change the signs, if you look back at this later, it makes it a little bit harder to follow to see what the problem said. So I, I prefer personally to put the negative outside uh, and then not change the signs but do this mentally. x cubed minus x cubed is 0. 7x squared take away x squared is 6x squared. And now, who can tell me what is negative 9x take away negative 2x? Negative 7x. Negative 7x. Uh, because this is actually negative 9x plus 2x. See, if you change that side, that's plus 2x. Negative 9 plus 2 is minus 7. And because I've eliminated the cubes, I can bring down the next term, and I can divide x squared into 6x squared, and it goes 6 times. And I'll put the 6 in the constant, in the constant column. Multiplying, I get 6x squared plus 6x minus 12, and here I have to subtract again. So we'll see what kind of a problem uh, Stephen has made up for us here as we, as we work this out, see how bad the numbers get. 6x squared minus 6x squared is 0. Now, what is negative 7x minus plus 6x? Negative 13x. Negative 13x, thank you very much. And in the constant column, 13 take away negative 12 is? 25. Plus 25, yes, yeah, so I'll add on a 25 there. Uh, and I can no longer do this division because I've gotten a degree too small, so this is my remainder term. And I would express this as a fraction over here on the end. Now, it looks like I don't have room to write that in there. I didn't leave myself enough space. So my answer would be x plus 6 plus negative 13x plus 25 all over the divisor x squared plus x minus 2. Now, sometimes uh, students... Uh, prefer to move the negative out in front. In fact, frankly, I do too. But if you move this negative out in front, you have to remember to take the negative out of both terms. So an alternative answer would be x plus 6 minus, uh, and this will be 13x minus 25, because I factored the negative out of, uh, out of both terms, over x squared plus x minus 2. I hope you can still see all that on the screen. Uh, where in this problem do you think is the most likely place for someone to make an error? The subtraction. In the subtraction, yes. So you have to be very careful of the subtraction. Uh, and of course, if you make one, one subtraction mistake, it throws everything else off after that. Um, if I'm, when I'm grading these, if you make a careless error with your subtraction, but you generally understand the process after that, I'll take off something for the subtraction error, but I'll generally give you credit for the problem. Now, if you make several subtraction mistakes, then of course I'll have to take off more points. But uh, don't think that you're doomed to miss the problem completely just because you might make a subtraction mistake. Uh, I, I do. I make subtraction mistakes as well. That's probably why my wife balances our checkbook. But uh, that's another story. Okay. Um, now let's do a synthetic division problem. 
And um, I'll tell you what, could someone make up a synthetic division problem for us? A problem that would be appropriate for synthetic division? You don't have to be too hard on us, but uh, something that would take a few steps. Or shall I make up one? You Jenny, up you look one. like you have something in, on mine. Well, I'm thinking, do you want both parts of it? The, what you uh, Yeah, so we want the, the dividend and the divisor both. Okay, let's do x cubed okay. minus 6x squared okay. plus 2. Plus 2. Oh, okay. Uh, what do you notice? Uh, she's kind of throwing a little ringer in there for us. What's, what's different about this we have to be careful of? Missing the x term. She's, she's miss we're missing the x term, so we have to be sure to put in a 0 there when we do our synthetic division. And Jenny, what would you like for us to divide this by? Try x minus 1. x minus 1. Okay, she's being very kind with x minus 1. <laughs> okay, so when I use synthetic division, the process is that I put the coefficients of the dividend inside 1, negative 6, 0, and 2. You don't need to put the plus on the 2. And outside, normally, I would just put the negative 1. So you just throw away the x. But if you'd like to, to add rather than subtract, most people would, you change that sign to a plus 1. So I'll put a 1 here. And in other words, this number becomes the root, or the 0, of that divisor. 1 is what makes that 0. So by changing the sign, you now have the root. And now we can add. Let me just make a note over here that I'll be adding. If you don't change that sign, if for some reason you want to put negative 1 here, you have to do subtraction in these columns. But of course, subtraction is where people tend to make more mistakes, at least I would. OK, so we begin this by bringing down the 1. And then 1 times 1 is 1. And we add now, so we get negative 5. 1 times negative 5 is negative 5. And I add and get negative 5. 1 times negative 5 is still negative 5, and I add and I get negative 3. That's my remainder. So what this tells me is this answer is this quadratic with this remainder. This is a quadratic, not a cubic, because if that's the remainder, here's the constant term, the linear term, and the quadratic term. So my answer is x squared minus 5x minus 5 with a remainder of negative 3. Now I think I'll put the negative in front and put a positive 3 over x minus 1, and that's the quotient. Now, this is exactly what you'd get if you were using long division. Uh, but um, there's no need to go to that. And as a matter of fact, on the exam, if I ask you to use synthetic division here, then I wouldn't, wanna, I wouldn't want you to be using long division for that. Um, another <coughs> item in this section, uh, episode 10, there was the remainder theorem. Let me just remind you what that says. And the remainder theorem says uh, when dividing a polynomial, p of x, like this could be a cubic polynomial, fourth degree polynomial, by a linear factor, let's say x minus c. So if you're dividing this by the, by the divisor x minus c, the remainder is Um, P evaluated at C. All you do is take the root or the zero of the divisor, plug it into the polynomial, and that'll tell you the remainder. For example, here's a, here's a problem that would require that. What if I said, find the remainder in this division problem? Um, let's say it's 2x to the fourth minus 5x cubed plus 1 um, when divided by um, x minus, um, oh, let's say, yeah, x minus 2. OK, find the remainder. Uh, but let's say I want to do this without dividing, um, without dividing. Now, you might say, Dennis, how can we find the remainder when you divide if you don't allow us to divide? Well, if you use this remainder theorem up here, it says the remainder will be the polynomial. This is the polynomial right here. Uh, P evaluated at the root 2. So that'll be 2 times 2 to the 4th minus 5 times 2 cubed plus 1. And let's see, 2 to the 4th is 16. So when you double it, that's 32. Minus uh, 5 times 8 is 40, plus 1. 
and that gives me uh, negative 7. So the remainder will be negative 7. Now, if you actually carry out this division and divide x minus 2 into this fourth degree polynomial, you should find that the remainder is negative 7, using either synthetic division or long division. But of course, this said to do it without dividing, so we've been able to find the remainder uh, very quickly. Okay, the other theorem that you need to know is the factor theorem, and we use this quite a bit in the next episode. And the factor theorem says, um, x minus c is a factor of the polynomial p of x uh, if and only if Uh, p of c is 0. That means if the remainder is 0. So this is actually, shall we say, a corollary to the remainder theorem that uh, says um, you have a factor whenever the remainder is 0 and the remainder is 0 whenever p evaluated at c is, is 0. Uh, you'll, see, you'll see us use the factor theorem when we come to the, next, uh, to the next episode. Speaking of which, let's go to episode 11 and look at some things we need to know from episode 11. <coughs> uh, first of all, we should be able to factor and graph polynomial functions using uh, Descartes' rule, uh, Descartes' rule and the rational root theorem. And then we should be able to solve applications of polynomial functions. And I, I put a note in there that uh, no graphing calculator would be needed. If it's, if it's an application that requires you to, to graph a polynomial function, it's something you should be able to graph using the techniques listed just above it. So uh, let's take an example. and. Um, Let's see, let me find a problem in this book here uh, that we can use to demonstrate. Um, I'm going to take a polynomial like um, um, Okay, let's take this polynomial. Uh, P of x is uh, 2x to the fourth plus 3x cubed minus 4x squared minus 3x plus 2. Now, what I'd like to do is to factor this polynomial in graph. So for the instructions, I'll put right below it, I'll say factor and graph. Um, okay, well, let's see. First of all, I'd like to decide uh, what are the possible number of positive and negative roots, and I use Descartes' rule of signs for that. So to find the number of positive roots, let's just put positive uh, roots over here, or you might say positive zeros. Uh, what I do is count the number of sign changes, and it looks like there are one, two sign changes. So there are either two or none for the positive roots, either two or, or zero positive roots. Uh, now, what about the negative roots? What do we do? Uh, substitute in negative x for x. Negative x for x. Now, you know, actually, graphically, what that does, when you replace x with negative x, what that does is flip the graph across the y-axis. So when you're looking for negative roots, that moves them over to the positive side, and then you just count the number of positive roots in that flipped graph. So if I substitute in a negative x for a positive x, well, let's see, negative x to the fourth power is x to the fourth, so this is 2x to the fourth. And if I put in a negative x and cube it, that'll be a minus 3x cubed. Um, what, what will this term be? Well, I think that's going to be a negative 4x squared, and that'll be a positive 3x and a positive 2. Of course, the, the 2 doesn't change because there's no substitution in it. So if I count the sign changes, I get 1, two sign changes there. So it looks like we have either two or none sign changes. Stephen? All you have to do is change the signs on the odd powers, correct? You know, as a matter of fact, that's right. If it's an even power, taking an even power of a negative x is going to leave it as it was. And if it's an odd power on a negative x, you're going to produce an extra negative in front, so you change the sign. So that, that would be a shortcut you could certainly use. Yeah, so every, every odd power changes signs, every even power remains the same. Um, Okay, now I'm going to take out the p of negative x so that I have some room to work here. The next thing I need to do is to figure out what are my po possible choices for p over q. And to do that, I need to list possible choices for p and possible choices for q. Now, p has to be a divisor of the constant term. And so that would be plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 2. And q 
is a, has to be a divisor of the lead coefficient of the highest power term, which is also a two. That's a little ambiguous because we have twos at both ends. So the Q's have to divide the, the lead coefficient, and that'll be plus or minus one or plus or minus two. So when I go to list the possible choices of P over Q, what would they be? In fact, I'm going to move that back so I have a little more room to write them. Who can tell me what are the, what are the possible choices for P <coughs> over Q that could be rational roots? One, negative one. Uh, plus or minus one, yeah. Plus or minus two. Plus or minus two. Plus or minus one half. And uh, plus or minus one half. And I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah, so we're putting P's over Q's. So we can get plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus a half. Or if I put twos over twos, that's plus or minus one, and we've already got that one listed. Now, what's significant about this set is that of these six numbers, these are the only rational numbers that could conceivably be a root of this polynomial. So, for example, if you're wondering about a 3 or a negative 5 or a plus 2 thirds, none of those could be a rational root of this polynomial. And so we've narrowed it down from an in infinitely many rational roots to only 6. Now, we'll check these one at a time, and we'll do that by synthetic division using the factor theorem. Uh, if I'm going to pick a number, I'd, I'd try to make it easy on myself. So let's go with a plus 1, first of all. And I'm going to divide 1 into the polynomial uh, 2, 3, negative 4, negative 3, and 2. Now, if 1 divides this, by the way, I'm going to be adding. If 1 divides this, then by the factor theorem, that means that x minus 1 is a factor of the polynomial. So I'll bring the 2 straight down. 1 times 2 is 2. I'll add and get 5. 1 times 5 is 5. I'll add and I'll get a 1. 1 times 1 is 1, so I get negative 2. Multiplying negative 2, I got a 0, so we, we found a root right away. And that tells me that this polynomial factors uh, into, maybe I can just squeeze it in here, x minus 1 times another polynomial. And let's see, that was originally fourth degree, and I'm dividing out a linear polynomial. This should be a cubic. And can anyone tell me what cubic that'll be? 2x cubed? Yes. Plus 5x squared? Right. Um, plus, plus 1. Pl well, plus x. Oh, plus x. And then minus 2. Minus 2. Yeah. So, uh, so this, this represents the, the cubic, the, the, the missing cubic factor. Okay. Uh, now, you know, 1 could be a root again. So we don't want to over overlook a multiple root. So I'm going to try dividing 1 again into um, 2, 5, 1, negative 2. Because, see, now we're looking for factors of this cubic. So 2, 2, 7, 7, 8, doesn't look like. Doesn't look like we're going to get a 0 here, so we don't even have to worry about uh, calculating that number. Um, let's go to the negative one. Let's try a negative one here. And we have 2, 5, 1, negative 2. So I get 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3. Adding, I get negative 2, 2. And I get a 0, so we found another root. So this is now going to be x minus 1 times, uh, what's the factor for this divisor? For this? x plus 1. x plus 1 times, and now my missing factor goes from cubic to quadratic, and this is the quadratic that's going to be um, 2x squared plus 3x minus 2. And what's good about a quadratic is we, if it factors, we should be able to factor it by sight. Um, <coughs> so let's see if that will factor. Uh, if it does, it should be a 2x and an x. And I think if I put a plus 2 here and a minus 1 there, that's the complete factorization. So what turned out to be the zeros out of this list? Which numbers turned out to be zeros? Um, plus 1 was a 0. Negative 1. Negative 1 was a 0. 1 half. One half, yeah, and uh, you see what, what Stephen's doing is if you set this equal to zero and solve for x, you get one half, and negative two. Negative two. So four of these six numbers turned out to be roots. So it's not surprising that the very first number I tried uh, was a was a root because four out of six of them were going to be roots. So this is the factorization. Now when I go to draw the graph, let's put the graph right below it here. Uh, I want to sketch the graph using uh, principles that we learned uh, earlier. And 
So I'm going to locate the zeros, and the zeros are at 1 and at negative 1. And at 1 half, I'll squeeze 1 half in here, this is 1. And at negative 2, that's, that's negative 2 right there. Um, and if I look at my polynomial, that was a positive x to the fourth, 2x to the fourth. So that says this side goes up. And what's the multiplicity of every factor? 1. Is multiplicity 1. So the multiplicity 1, that tells me my graph passes through each one of these. So it passes through here, it passes through there, it passes through here, and it passes through there, and it goes back up. And so it has that typical fourth power look. Both sides are going, are going together. In this case, they're both going up. You notice when I drew my graph, uh, I drew this, this dip a little bit lower than that one. In fact, I probably should have made it even lower than that. That's because I had a span of one to wander away and come back. Over here, I had a span of only one half, so I had to come back fairly quickly. And in the middle, I had a span of one and a half, so I went up even more there than I went down here. That's the y-axis and the x-axis. And this is a rough sketch of P. If you were to graph this on a graphing calculator, that's more or less what you would what you would see for the graph. I think it's a fairly, fairly close approximation for what little time we spent on finding the factors. Um, <clears throat> while I'm drawing graphs like that, let me just ask you this question. How would I graph this polynomial? Suppose it's already been factored. Let's say it's a negative uh, x minus 2 squared times x uh, plus 1 to the third power times uh, x minus 3 to the first power. What is the degree of this polynomial if I were to multiply it out? 6. This is a 6th degree <coughs> polynomial. <coughs> yes. 6th degree. Because you see there's, a, there's an x squared there. There's an x cubed when I expand that times x. So x squared times x cubed times x makes x to the sixth. And the negative says it's going to be inverted. So I'm expecting, for an even degree, both sides go either up together or they go down together. And this is inverted. So I'm expecting to see both sides go down on this graph. And uh, if I locate these x-intercepts, let's see, I'll put a point at 2, I'll put a point at 3, and I'll put a point over here at negative 1. And I'm expecting to see the graph come up from below on the right-hand side. So it comes up to 3. And when it gets to 3, it's going to pass right on through because that has multiplicity That has multiplicity 1. It's going to turn. Eventually, it'll turn, and it'll come back to 2. And at 2, it's going to turn around and go back up because that had multiplicity 2. So it looks somewhat like a parabola right there. Now, I expect in this next interval, it's going to go off pretty far before it comes back down but I don't have a lot of room to show it. So it, it goes up quite a ways, comes back down, and as it approaches negative 1, you notice this factor has uh, multiplicity 3. So here it looks a bit like a cubic function. It comes in, it levels off, it turns, and it goes back down. And sure enough, I do have both, both edges going down on the right and on the left. And this is a rough sketch of the function p. So you should be able to sketch graphs of uh, functions like that. Um, let's go to the next um, episode. Let's see, episode 12, there we are, okay. Uh, complex roots of polynomials and uh, construction of polynomials with real coefficients for if you're given the degree and the roots. Why don't we take an example of that latter, uh, that latter part, reconstructing a polynomial given um, its degree and its roots. Suppose I told you I'm looking for a polynomial that I'll call, I'll call this one f of x. And suppose I told you that this polynomial is a fourth degree polynomial <coughs> with real coefficients. That's significant. With real coefficients. And suppose I told you two of its roots. Uh, one of the roots is um, one. And another root is uh, 1. And let me give you a third root. The third root is 2 minus i. In other words, this has a root of multiplicity 2, because 1's listed twice. And then it has a complex number root. Now, to get a fourth degree polynomial with real coefficients, 
I have to have one more root, and to get real coefficients, it has to be very specific. Can anyone tell me what a fourth root would be here? The conjugate of the complex number. It, it could be a conjugate of this, so 2, two, plus, plus, I. two plus I, yeah. Someone might say, Dennis, is there anything else that fourth root could possibly be? Well, any non-zero multiple of 2 plus i, for example, uh, if you tripled it, 6 plus 3i. So any, any multiple of 2 plus i could be a root, but this is sort of the, uh, the, the, the fourth root in its primitive form. So f of x looks like this. f of x is going to be x minus 1 times x minus 1 again, so I'll just square that, times x minus the root 2 minus i, and x minus the root 2 plus i. Now, you know, backing up here, uh, if, if you were to ask, why did you know to put in the conjugate? Just because 2 minus i is in there, why not, why not some other number here? Well, if you want to get real coefficients and no imaginary numbers or complex numbers in the coefficients, you have to have complex roots appearing in conjugate pairs. So if you change the minus to a plus, that's, that's its conjugate. Okay, now, I need to multiply this out to figure out what the polynomial is. Well, x minus 1 squared is x squared minus 2x plus 1. And over here, when I multiply this out, what I'm going to do is distribute the negative signs, x minus 2 plus i and x minus 2 minus i. Now, there's a little trick here that can save you some effort in this multiplication. Rather than multiplying these two, um, shall we say, trinomials together um, in that form, I'm going to group the x minus 2's together, group those, and group these in this way. x squared minus 2x plus 1 times the quantity x minus 2 plus i times the quantity uh, x minus 2 minus i. Now, what's the advantage of writing these two trinomials in this form so that actually I have a binomial and a binomial, a sum and a difference? What's the advantage of that? It's the difference of squares. This is the difference of two squares, so this is easily multiplied. I haven't done anything with this first trinomial. It's sort of waiting in the wings for me to finish this multiplication. So I'm going to multiply the difference of two squares here, a plus b and a minus b. So I'm going to get a squared, or x minus 2 squared, minus uh, b squared. And b squared is minus, uh, well, is, is uh, i squared. So uh, now I can reduce that, and I have x squared minus 2x plus 1 times x squared minus 4x plus 4 plus 2. One And you notice there are no more imaginary numbers in here. Everything is real, so I'm going to end up with a polynomial with real coefficients. So this is x squared minus 2x plus 1 times x squared minus 4x plus 5. Okay, well, we're almost to the polynomial. Um, the only way I can get a fourth power is when I multiply these two terms together. That's x to the fourth. Now, how can I get cubic terms? Well, I can get cubic terms if I multiply these two together. That's uh, negative 4x cubed. And here's another one that makes negative, uh, negative 2x cubed more, makes negative 6x cubed. How can I get x squared terms? Well, let's see, there's a 5x squared. And here's a plus 1x squared, that makes a 6x squared. But here's another way I can get uh, 8 more x squared makes uh, 14x squared plus 14x squared. Uh, now, what about the linear terms? Well, right here I can get a negative 10x, and here I get a negative 4x makes a negative 14x. I think those are the only ways you can get uh, x to the first power. And then the constant term is plus 5. So this is the polynomial we're looking for. You notice it is a fourth degree polynomial. Um, it does have real coefficients, and it does uh, it, it has four roots, although they're not all real roots. Now, you notice if I were working this backwards, if I were using Descartes' rule of signs, look at the number of sign changes. There is one, two, three, four sign changes. So according to Descartes' rule of signs, how many possible positive roots could there be? Four, two, or none. Four, two, or none. So when you go to look for positive roots, if we were working this backwards, there would be four, two, or none and it turns out to be two. See, we have these two positive roots. 
And if you calculated f at negative x, in the interest of time, I won't write it all out, I think you would see no sign changes, which means this has no negative roots. And that's exactly right. We have no negative roots up here. So we have two positive roots, no negative roots, and we have two complex number roots. See, complex numbers are not, not considered positive or negative. We have no way of comparing one to be larger than the other. So uh, we have no, no further positive or negative roots from them. Okay, let's go to episode uh, 13, no, 14, no, 13. Episode 13 is next. Okay, here we have uh, transformations of two more fundamental functions, f of x equals 1 over x and g of x equals 1 over x squared. And uh, you may recall that in those last two episodes, episode 13 and 14, uh, this was the beginning of a rather prolonged discussion of rational functions. And these functions can look rather complex by the time we get to episode 14, but they're not that difficult to graph. So we want to go over some examples of all this to make you feel comfortable about it before you take the test. Let's begin with these fundamental functions. Uh, take, for example, uh, f of x equals 1 over x. Uh, it's a graph. Looks like this. There were only two target points. And that was at, those were at 1, 1, and at negative 1, negative 1. The reason there wasn't a target point at the origin, or for x equals 0, is because this function is undefined at 0. We actually have a vertical asymptote at 0. So then we have to know the shape of the graph, and the graph comes down and looks like, looks like this. The other fundamental function <coughs> is g of x equals 1 over x squared. Now, you notice this function can never be negative because it's 1 over a square. So there's no way we'll ever get a negative number. So we expect from the beginning to see this graph above the x-axis. And when I graph it, there are two target points. And not surprising from all that we've seen and done, the target points are at 1, 1 and at negative 1, 1. Uh, the difference is not only are we in the first and second quadrants, but the graph is a little bit steeper coming in and it approaches the x-axis, the horizontal asymptote, a little bit faster. So this is all relative. <clears throat> I don't know that you can actually make these discriminations very easily when you draw these. And I'm certainly not uh, an artist. But, uh, but you, you should know the fact that uh, this function approaches the x-axis faster than 1 over x did. So we have a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis and a vertical asymptote at the y-axis uh, once again. Now, there were transformations of these functions. And rather than me drawing the graph of a transformation, let me do this. I'm going to draw the graph of a function, and I want you to tell me a reasonable rule for this graph. So I'm going to call this function, um, why don't we call it r of x for rational function. And the graph looks like this. And I'll give you a few minutes to think about it, class. And then I want you to tell me what you think might be the rule of this function. Uh, there is a horizontal asymptote at 2. That's the line y equals 2. There is a vertical asymptote at negative 1. This is the vertical line x equals negative 1. And there are target points here and here. And the function looks like this. Now, knowing what we know about these fundamental graphs, I think you can predict a rule for a function that would look like this. <coughs> First of all, do you think it's going to look like uh, f of x equals 1 over x that's been altered? Or is it going to look like g of x equals 1 over x squared? Which one do you think it'll be? g of x. It's going to be g of x equals 1 over x squared because both of these turn down, so they go together. Now, the fact that they turn down tells you what about the function rule. Negative in front There's of it. There's going to be a negative in front of it. Okay, so I'm going to put a negative up there already. And uh, it, does it look like there's a stretch on this, or did we merely flip it over? We just flipped it over. We just flipped it over, because look, we've gone from the new origin, we've gone over one and down one. We didn't go down three, or we didn't go down a half, so there's no stretch on it. So that tells me that the numerator is going to have a one in it up there. And I, I think I'll erase that x equals one, because it's sort of in the way. Okay, now. Instead of putting x squared here, I'm going to have to put a shift in it that shifts it over to the left one. So what should go in those parentheses? x 
X plus one. X plus one, yes. X plus one, and that's been squared. Now, I think we're still missing one thing. What, what are we still missing here, Jenny? Plus two. We have to add plus two because this graph has been raised to, so I have to put a two uh, outside. That is a two, not a Z. <laughs> My two sometimes look like Z, so that is a two there. So this would be an excellent uh, rule for this function. Now, you know what makes this a little, a little oh, are there any questions about that from anyone in the class? Okay, what makes, this, uh, what makes these functions uh, easily disguised is this rule could also be written as two minus one over x plus one squared. So in other words, the two could be put in front, and so you may not recognize that that's a vertical shift because it's written on the left instead of on the right. Another way w this can be disguised is we could put this all over a common denominator. So this would be two times x plus one squared minus one. I had to multiply this term top and bottom by x plus one squared. And if you multiply that out, <coughs> the numerator would be two x squared plus four x plus two, but minus one makes a plus one over x squared plus two x plus one. What I've done is I've expanded the x plus one squared on top and on bottom and collected terms. I was sort of in a hurry, so I saved a bit of time. This is the same function. Now, if I were to give you a graph, this is a perfectly good answer, but all of these other functions have that very same graph. So we have to be careful um, to, to recognize these things go by various names, just like you and I go by various names. And uh, somehow we don't get confused and we refer to each other by, say, if you call me Mr. Allison or Dennis, I, I know who you're talking about. Well, you want to be, uh, be comfortable with naming functions by various names. Now, to that regard, let's go to episode 14 and see how um, these names for various functions can be graphed. Uh, we should be able to find the intercepts of rational functions. We'll talk about that in a minute. We should know how to write uh, asymptotes and holes for rational functions and how to test each side of an asymptote. Let me kind of summarize that with a, with a graph here. Suppose I were going to graph uh, this rational function, f of x equals. I'll just make up something as I go along here. Um, <coughs> suppose, uh, suppose in the numerator we had uh, x plus 1 times x minus 2. And in the denominator, suppose we have um, x plus 2 times x minus 3. Okay, now this looks to be a long shot away from those fundamental graphs we were looking at just a moment ago. But we don't have time to do uh, an example of everything that leads up to this. But I, I think this example will capture a number of important ideas. Um, let's see, first of all, this function will have several vertical asymptotes. Can anyone tell me where the vertical asymptotes are? At negative 2 and 3. <laughs> At and negative I, 2 and positive 3, because yeah. those are where you divide by 0, and those factors don't cancel. Neither of them cancel. So one vertical asymptote is x equals negative 2. Another one is x equals 3. Uh, by the way, Jeff, while we're on the subject, if this had been an x minus 3 over x minus 3, in other words, if that would cancel, this wouldn't be a vertical asymptote. What would it be? Uh, it'd be a hole in the graph. There'd, there'd be a hole rather than a vertical asymptote. So it's very tricky. What I would do is I would cancel off <coughs> those factors. I'd draw my graph of whatever's left over, and I'd go back and fill in a hole right there. Um, okay, now, is there a horizontal asymptote? I think there is. Is there a horizontal asymptote? Well, to find that, I'm going to need to divide this out. You notice I have a quadratic over a quadratic. This is x squared minus x minus 2 over x squared minus x minus 6. So I'm going to carry out that long division down here to see what that'll be. And um, looks like uh, my divisor goes into this only one time, x squared minus x minus 6. And when I subtract that, everything cancels except I get a plus 4. So this is going to be 1 over 4 uh, one, uh, 1 plus 4 over x, mi uh, x squared minus x minus 6. So let's write that in here as well. 4 over um, x plus 2 times x minus 3 plus 1. What I've done here is I've factored that denominator and put the plus 1 outside. Uh, so what's the horizontal asymptote? 
<coughs> this equals this equals this. What's the horizontal asymptote? Was there a vertical shift? Yes, there's a vertical shift up one. Of one. So that means the horizontal asymptote moved up one. And uh, so right here, I'll say the horizontal asymptote is y equals 1. OK, are there any x-intercepts in this graph? Yes. Yeah, let's well, see, to find x-intercepts, we let uh, y be 0. So if I let y be 0, then what I'll need to do is multiply both sides by x plus 2, x minus 3 and I get 0 equals x plus 1 and x minus 2. So in other words, whatever are the roots of the numerator become the x-intercepts. So this is going to have an x-intercept at x equals negative 1 and an x-intercept at x equals 2. Um, and finally, is there a y-intercept? Well, to find a y-intercept, I let x be 0. Now, of all of these, uh, forms, I think probably the simplest one to plug in a zero is this one right here. Because if I plug a zero in on top, I get negative two. And if I plug zero in on bottom, I get negative six. You could have found the same information by plugging in zero over here, but I think this is a little faster. And so we get one third. So I have a y intercept at one third. Now, let's put all this information together and draw this rather complex graph. But with this information, it should go fairly smoothly. Um, <coughs> OK, and if I go up and down on the scale, I'm going to put in my vertical asymptotes at negative 2 and at positive 3. OK, and then I'm going to put a horizontal asymptote at plus 1. Now, for a function this complicated, there are no target points to plot. That's something I should, I should certainly mention to you, because you see, uh, we don't have just a single factor on bottom that's been squared, but we have several factors all over, and those tend to affect where I would have placed the target point. So instead, what I have to do is go on the basis of the information I've listed over here. X-intercepts at negative 1 and at plus 2. And a Y-intercept that's 1 third, 1 third right here. Okay, now let's look at the graph to the right of 3. This is 3 right here. You notice there's no x-intercept. So that tells me the graph has to turn up because it cannot turn down. It would have crossed the x-axis. So my graph has to look like this. And you might say, Dennis, I'm, I'm, uh, if, you, if you were doing this at home, you might draw this a little bit closer in and turn, or you may turn further out. Those things are relative, and, and as long as you have this general idea, I'll accept it. By the way, what happens over on this side? Will it be above or below? Above. It's above, because there are no x-intercepts over here. If I had had an x-intercept, I'd know it had to turn down, but instead it has to turn up because it can't cross the x-axis. Now in the middle, in the middle, let's see, um, I have an x-intercept here, multiplicity 1, which tells me the graph passes through. And it's got to go over here, so it must have been passing through this way, because it has to get over to that point. So that tells me it must be turning down here. And uh, that tells me that my graph goes up, it goes through this point, it passes through there, and it turns down over here. I haven't drawn that very well. It's probably a little bit more symmetrical than what I've, what I've shown. But uh, because it crosses the axis, and because it has to go to the positive y-axis, my graph has to turn down. It cannot turn around and go back up because there are no more x-intercepts. So it has to keep going down. So here is a graph of this very complex function and we did it with very little effort. Uh, we did have to do long division, but that's not particularly a lot of effort. And we had to know about asymptotes and intercepts. And multiplicity. I knew that the multiplicity of each x-intercept was 1, so the graph passed through. So I think that's quite an accomplishment considering what little uh, we had to go on.